Good afternoon. Welcome to Digital for Green Recovery, the flagship event of the UNDP Global Center for Technology, Innovation, and Sustainable Development. Hi, I'm Vivian, and I'll be the MC for today's event. The United Nations Development Program, UNDP, is fighting to end the injustice of poverty, inequality, and climate change. Working in 170 countries, UNDP helps nations build integrated, lasting solutions for people and the planet. The UNDP Global Center Singapore is a joint initiative of UNDP and this government of Singapore. It's a knowledge, policy, solutions hub for sustainable development with a focus on technology, innovation, and partnership as a key tool in this journey. So today, today's flagship event brings together global experts and innovators on stage and in this audience to explore the role of digital in catalyzing a green recovery. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted how planetary and social imbalances reinforce each other. It is this interplay that calls for a new and urgent trajectory of human development, a green recovery, that prioritizes sustainable development and transform the way we live, work, and play. In this journey, Few tools have been as impactful as digital. Digital, There's a huge opportunity for digital tools with their global reach to facilitate and accelerate a green recovery at unprecedented scale, but only if their use and role is founded on inclusion and sustainability. We hope that the themes explored today will shape a better understanding of how we can leverage digital in driving this inclusive and green recovery. To kickstart the event, I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Riyad Medeb, Interim Director of the UNDP Global Center for Technology, Innovation and Sustainable Development. Riyad, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. A warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us today at the flagship event of the UNDP Global Center for Technology, Innovation, and Sustainable Development. We are a joint initiative of the United Nations Development Program and the government of Singapore aimed at identifying and co-creating technological solutions for sustainable development. I want to take this opportunity to thank the government of Singapore and all our partners present here for your generous support and strategic collaboration over the last four years. This event for our, offers for us an opportunity to reflect on our collective achievements, as well as shape priorities and partnership to drive the Global Center's future work around digital for sustainable development in the decade of action. It is heartening that we are able to have in-person gathering like this again. COVID-19 has highlighted how digital is fast becoming the global metric of both inclusion and exclusion. Within 2.9 billion people still offline, the digital divide, notably the lack of affordable broadband internet and appropriate digital skills, has become the key barrier for individual communities and countries to capitalize on the boundless opportunities for growth and progress offered by the increasingly digital economy. As one of the starkest examples of the digital divide, millions of individuals, especially the most vulnerable, were prevented from working or studying from home during this crisis. In 2020, billions of children significantly missed out on schooling, and over 100 million more children fell below the minimum reading proficiency level and other areas of academic learning. This generation of children could lose a combined total of $17 trillion in lifetime earning. As we start seeing the green shoots of recovery from the COVID-19 crisis, it gives us an opportunity to reflect on what worked well. And digital readiness certainly played a crucial role. Countries that had proper digital foundation in place before the pandemic were much better prepared and equipped to respond to the citizen needs, including through the effective delivery of public services, such as the livelihood support, healthcare, social security benefit, and tele-education. 
Digital transformation is also one of the key enablers to advance the global commitment around the Paris Agreement to undertake ambitious effort to combat climate change and adapt to its effect. A green and inclusive recovery is fundamental to emerging stronger from the three seas crisis which are, we are facing in the form of COVID, climate change, and conflict. These are both causes and symptoms of a worsening economic condition and declining level of human development, witnessed for the first time in a generation. Business as usual is no longer a viable option for people and the planet. A green recovery is foundational for setting the world on a trajectory to achieve the sustainable development goals. And digital is proving to be a key enabler for countries in driving a green recovery. Ecuador, for example, is building a national digital traceability system for tracking and monitoring deforestation-free commodities like coffee and cocoa from the Ecuadorian Amazon. It makes use a high-resolution satellite imagery and artificial intelligence to monitor land use change at the farm level, along with blockchain to track commodities through the supply chain. Indonesia has developed a mobile application that helps law enforcers in the field, such as forest rangers, custom officials, and coast guard, to easily identify protect wildlife species, supporting the fight to protect biodiversity. Whereas in Rwanda, he is using low-cost IoT-enabled sensor as weather station. They are locally made, easily to install, and provide smallholder farmers early warning on impending climate hazards. Additionally, a number of countries in Africa have come together to explore the use of digital platform to aggregate and analyze data on existing and planned mini-grid projects. This is aimed at bringing further standardization in the African energy sector and catalyze a green transition. UNDP is supporting this and the initiative of several countries around the world in leveraging the power of digital for green recovery, redoubling our effort to scale renewable energy, transition to a circular and inclusive economy, and prioritize biodiversity and environmental protection. Beyond facilitating speed of recovery, digital is unleashing new ways of doing development for emerging tech like AI and blockchain to more established ones like the ubiquitous mobile phone and the link mobile payment service. Digital can be a foundational driver of change and empowering force for people and planet. Digital is reshaping the dynamic between the economy, government, business, and civil society. But what's the point of digitalization if it continues to entrench the existing digital divides. Through their energy and material requirement and influence on consumer demand, digital technology have accelerated the exponential rise of human impact on natural environment. Given the demand for data and the associated energy required to process this data, the digital industry's carbon footprint is accelerating at a remarkable rate. It is on a path to account for about 14% of global emission by 2040, roughly the same share as that the US. Integrating sustainable development in digital transformation narrative is central to ensuring a green recovery, one that drive inclusive digital access and capacity, second, promote openness and open data to track countries' progress on the sustainable development goals and climate commitment, and third, foster innovation that increase the efficiency of digital technologies and manage consumption to mitigate environmental footprint of industries. Doing so, we will require deliberate effort across the public and private sector and both local action and global leaderships. With this in mind, I would like to close by emphasizing three key priorities and opportunities for inclusive and sustainable digitalization. Firstly, we must put people at the center of innovation. The scale and pace of action required to combat climate change and poverty requires a more concerted approach to technology, one that emphasizes user-centered solution design, partnership, and the shaping of open source data and other innovation as digital public goods. At the same time, we must apply the principle of the sustainable development goals to leave no one behind in order to mitigate the risk of fueling the existing unsustainable behaviors and further widening the digital divide. 
In this context, we need to build accessible digital infrastructure and achieve basic digital needs so that everyone can benefit from the opportunities in this digital age. While doing so, we must also ensure that technical standards and exploration of emerging technologies are human-centered, founded on the needs, realities, and aspiration of people to respond to the local context. An example can be found here in Singapore, where the government has been supporting hawkers to, do, to go digital, including through the adoption of e-payment and providing financial incentives. Similarly, in Uganda, UNDP partners with the e-commerce company Jumia to train informal market vendors in Kampala with digital skills, enabling them to sell their produce online, achieve better prices, and sustain their livelihood during and after the pandemic shutdowns. Digital has a key role in development as an enabler in societies, government, and the economy. This extends to understanding how best to apply digital by building upon cross-pollination of ideas and best practices. Secondly, collaboration between innovation ecosystem must be strengthened. All innovation happens in an ecosystem comprising of government, program, policies and regulations, investors, incubators and accelerators, hackathon and pitch competition, educational institutions that produce talent and digital infrastructure. But currently, opportunities and the visibility of innovation ecosystem are unequally distributed globally. In part, this is due to the wide variability in funding, policy opportunities, and human capital across regions, where research and development are strongly concentrated in high, higher income countries. Similarly, most of the discourse on innovation in the context of sustainable development focuses on a handful of developing countries, entrench these inequities and risking lower income countries being considered a homogeneous group. Connecting innovation ecosystem does provide a great opportunity to break down silos and help promote more accessible knowledge sharing, as well as the exploration of application of digital technology in a more diverse context. Partnerships play a key role in promoting knowledge dissemination across sector. Finally, we need to build inclusive data infrastructure. Data is increasingly digital and relied on physical infrastructure like data centers, communication network, and energy infrastructure. However, such assets are not equally distributed. Less than 20% of low and middle income countries have foundational data infrastructure. And this goes beyond just physical infrastructure, since data is also about human capital, for example, skills to leverage cloud and other data infrastructure, cybersecurity and data analytics capabilities. Also, social norms and gender inequality underpin women's and girls' lack of access to digital device, data, and network, and overall digital use. According to latest studies, women are 1.6 times more likely than men to report lack of skills as a barrier to internet use. We need to ramp up effort to build data capacities in developing countries, with a particular focus on marginalized groups, to ensure that existing digital divides are not widened. Along with digital transformation, the collection, processing, and dissemination of data is accelerating and increasingly relying on access across multiple countries. Thus, in the global context, there is also a need to shape new models of data governance beyond national and other geographic borders to drive socioeconomic development. This reality demands engagement with the requirement of enabling cross-border data flows to drive industries, opportunities, and sectors. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate that digital is about more than just the technology that underpins it. It's about people. Digital is driving new processes, new innovations, and new business model in which everyone can benefit as long as we ensure that no one is left behind. Our work at the Global Center has shown us that there is a real appetite for boldness in digital. We all know that for the policymakers, getting the engagement and buy-in of citizens is crucial, but it's also difficult. What we are seeing and hearing is that citizens across the world 
want their government and order in the digital economy to be exploring, leading, advocating, and implementing digital for people and the planet. They want borderness. And UNDP is here to assist countries on this journey with our partner, the government of Singapore. And that brings me to my final point. Our role, yours and ours, is making this happen. Singapore's vibrant innovation ecosystem is central to our presence here. Singapore's reputation as a leader in generating technological solutions for green recovery and its entrepreneurial ecosystem is of great interest and inspiration in opportunity to developing countries around the world. And today's event is the beginning toward a strengthened collaboration with this ecosystem, including with policymakers, practitioners, think tank, business, and other relevant stakeholders for learning and sharing of best practices and driving innovation globally. And there are numerous strategic and exciting opportunities to advance this work, building on the foundations and capitalizing on the endless possibility of digital for green recovery. I invite you all to join us in this journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Riyadh, for laying out, down the, laying out the context for today's discussion. I think we all sense that urgency and the importance of such a green recovery that our people and planet desperately need today. Uh, I just want to once again welcome those who are just joining us. Um, we have a full house today. Uh, I think that shows you know, the commitment that uh, in, in our audience, um, this room full of global experts and innovators uh, in trying to tackle how we can harness the potential of digital for green recovery. So we do have a lineup of incredible speakers uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, thank you once again. Um, this is the flagship event of the UNDP Global Center for Technology, Innovation and Sustainable Development. So, our conversations today will kick off um, with a fireside chat, introducing and exploring the full potential of digital for an inclusive and green recovery, just as what Riyadh was mentioning in his keynote speech. We're delighted to have to be joined with two distinguished speakers, His Excellency Mr. Prit Turk and Ms. Esther An. Ambassador Prit Turk is Estonia's first resident ambassador to Singapore and the ASEAN. Ambassador Turk aims to strengthen collaboration between startup ecosystems in Singapore and Estonia, including through a tech corridor, leveraging on the power of digital. Ms. Esther An is the Chief Sustainability Officer at City Developments Limited, a sustainability practitioner for over two decades. Esther has led a number of pioneering initiatives in Singapore and beyond, including publishing the first sustainability report in Singapore in 2008 and issuing the first green bond by a Singapore company in 2017. So welcome you both. Thank you, Jessica. To facilitate this conversation, we are also delighted to have Jessica, Ms. Jessica Chiam, founder and managing director of Eco Business, Asia Pacific's leading media and business intelligence organization dedicated to sustainable development. Thank you, Jessica, for facilitating the conversation today. So um, with that, I hand over to you and we look forward to a great chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank UNDP for the invitation to moderate this very important dialogue. Really is full hours in here and uh, there's some chairs in front if anyone wants to sit as well. Um, I remember this time last year at the World City Summit, I was moderating a discussion and we were sitting one metre apart. We had to have less than 50 in a room and we had to speak with our masks on. And I think that, you know, it's, it's so encouraging to see the World City Summit being able to convene in person again and to feel the energy in a room. And I think that the COVID-19 pandemic obviously is the big context that we're having this discussion about. And we've entered really an era of unprecedented change and volatility. The COVID-19 pandemic, I think, has offered a glimpse of what is still to come. Experts are predicting that we are going to see disease X, which is going to be more lethal. There are also forecasts that climate change is going to result in economic damage that is 10 times the level of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I don't want to set up this discussion as doom and gloom, but in the context of the global challenges that we are seeing, there is also 
the solutions. And I think today's conversation really is to talk about how digitalization can help with the green recovery and what that would look like. I think in this operating environment where we are seeing you know, increasing nationalization, geopolitical tensions, as well as polarization, it is ever more important for the global community to be connected on one platform to increase governance and to increase transparency. And so I'm really excited to be hosting this fireside chat and Ambassador, I'm going to start off with you. Estonia is a small country like Singapore. I think both countries have punched above its weight to develop a reputation for being able to harness the power of digitalization to enable strong societies. Please share with us the experience and you know, how has it been so successful for Estonia? Thank you very much and uh, I'm really honored to be here and thank you for UNDP for inviting me. Uh, I have in my previous life some cooperation with UNDP and I know how important work you do in the world and I'm very happy that the Estonian government has a lot, lots of different cooperation projects with UNDP including in digital sphere and, and uh, our e-governance academy works closely with UNDP in different parts of the world to, to support uh, countries, cities, local governments in developing their digital uh, 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 strategies, uh, which is based on our experience, which you asked. I think it's a, it's, it can be a very long story, we don't have time, but I would highlight a few things which, uh, which has worked for us, and I think one which has helped Singapore as well is the size. <laughs> I think uh, size in this case is an uh, advantage, actually. Uh, so, uh, Estonia, 1.3 million people, uh, I think many things we can do as a test bed in a way and, and try out. But I think the main uh, reason has been, in our case, was the necessity. We didn't have a choice. 30 years ago when we uh, uh, got out of the occupation, we didn't have anything, so there was a choice. Uh, there was a will to join the European family, to be part of democratic, uh, uh, rich Europe, but how to do it? If we, and the only way, what we thought was that we have to uh, skip some steps and do some leapfrogging. And for us, the, the, what we decided was exactly IT and, uh, and digitalization, which gives some uh, tools which uh, uh, we used to, to uh, uh, boost our democratization, our economic development, uh, our inclusiveness in the society. I think it has been used in every aspect. The second very important part has been uh, cooperation with the private sector. At that time as well, the private sector was developing and, and innovation was in private sector. Government was very weak in, in this sense. And since then, I think innovation in our case uh, has been coming from the private sector and very well utilized then in, in the public sector. Uh, uh, then I think what was very important was that as a country you need a long-term strategy, you need a long-term vision as was mentioned for the infrastructure to be created. You don't do it overnight for your people, for your uh, uh, society to, uh, to educate them. That's a long-term uh, it has to be long-term goal. So, the uh, same time, long -term, for the long-term solutions, you need also a regulatory framework, you need uh, laws, you need a uh, uh, yeah, framework for business, or, uh, for the government to, to implement the digital solutions. And th but at the same time, I think, which is as crucial, and when we talk about uh, a green agenda now, it's about... Uh, solutions which really make difference quite quickly. So you get society involved, excited about the process. So you get the innovation uh, working as soon as possible. So in our case, for example, banking sector came along very quickly. So e-banking or already in 90s, or you have e-prescription for elderly, so they don't have to go to pharmacies. All these kinds of solutions actually are very important to, to, get the, to take the agenda forward. And I think the fourth point I want to uh, highlight is inclusiveness. And uh, that's something, uh, you have to see the society as whole. So in our case, there was a very strong push to the younger generation, because they are the ones who, uh, who uh, 
past uh, will be the society in the future, but not forgetting also the elderly or the or the those who uh, who uh, need some uh, help to be part of it. So this was right from the beginning part of the strategy to 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 uh, digitalize our society, and that's why I think these are one of the key reasons why we are digital Estonia today. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I think you make some really good points there, especially about the importance of rule of law, strong regulations to create that operating environment, and then the innovation ecosystem, being able to support the growth of the ecosystem is, is really imperative. Um, I want to come to Esther. Esther, you have been a sustainability pioneer in this space, and obviously the COVID-19 pandemic has you know, resulted in a, a huge impact on the community as well as on businesses. So for you at CDL, what does a green recovery look like, and how has digital tools played a role in that? Well, thank you, and a good afternoon, and thank you for having me. And I think uh, thanks to covid Actually, the world has also learned that the health of our planet, people, business and economies are all interconnected and interdependent. And I think we are all really living in an era where sustainability and digital revolutions actually converge. And uh, not just that, actually the will of political leaders, business leaders, investors, bankers, financiers and uh, you know, innovators all converge. And uh, I'm sure that you know, um, uh, those who were actually at Glasgow last year really can feel the sense of urgency and uh, race to zero is everywhere. And uh, as of now, uh, participating and supporting organizations, cities and investors and all that add up to more than 91% of the global GDP. And uh, being a uh, sustainability you know, advocate for 27 years now, okay, don't ask me how old I started. And uh, it's really a time, a changing, you know, for change and uh, accelerate change. But and, uh, we have heard from Riyadh, we have heard from Ambassador, the word about ecosystem is very important. No one entity can change the world. And when we are all talking about, you take uh, a village to raise a kid, you need the whole world to really save our planet. 28th July, just a week ago, it was actually the Earth Overshoot Day. That means we have actually used up this year's budget of all the natural resources. So now we really have to step up to save. It's like in your bank account, you are now OD already, so you have to really save. And how do you save? You need everybody to jump on, you know, to, uh, the, 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 uh, jump on board. And uh, for building sector, why we, are, we have been really uh, committed to this is because uh, globally, building uh, sectors account for more than 40% of greenhouse gas emission. Cities account for 70%. And cities also consume 50% of natural resources. For, pe for a country like Singapore, we lack natural resources, everybody know, and we are also renewable energy challenged. And we are next to the equator. We are heating up twice as fast as other parts of the world. So it is a very scary scenario. So for us as a building sector, we are not doing it alone because whether you are in the industry, you live, work and play and entertain in property. How you use buildings is also very important. Uh, research actually showed that people spend 90% of uh, your time indoor. So you have a, a role to play also in, the, in this race to zero. So we want everyone to work together. In the whole you know, uh, value chain, from the, the time we get hold of a plot of land, the design and then engage the procurement, the supply chain, what materials to buy and how we design it, Digital is very important. And we have actually used uh, digital and uh, AI to help us right from the start to design and uh, orientate our building. That can raise productivities by 50%, reduce heat gain by 20%. Without digital solutions, you can't do it manually. So uh, now, if you have time, I would really invite you to go out to see the City Innovation Innovator Space. After this, 5 o'clock, we will feature five startup very interesting startups that whether circular econo economy or reducing plastic waste packaging, please go out and support all these youngsters. Everybody has a role to play. And of course, it's now uh, Ambassador talking about the biggest, you know, the movers and shakers are the investors, are the financiers. ESG funds are growing huge, you know, uh, big time. And sustainable finance that also enabler. We can all talk about you know, digitalization, innovation, we talk about decarbonization, but without funding, 
you can't move in the middle. You can't really run fast. So there are three you know, de de uh, deliverables that we are looking at as a developer, as a private sector. Of course, the first one is, like I said, decarbonization towards net zero. The second one is digitalization innovation. Last but not least is disclosure and communication. Without disclosure, without data to communicate with investors and bankers, you can't get access to the fast-growing sustainable finance to accelerate action. I'll stop here first. Thank you so much, Esther. I love your energy. Uh, and the 3D there, I think, is, uh, so, is really important. Um, I want to pick up on two words, innovation and ecosystems. I think you both talked about the importance of this. Um, what tech corridors or ecosystems can we really see? And what are the fundamental ingredients to en enabling this? Because, I mean, if you think about any startup today that wants to, you know, gain scale, reach markets, you have to use technology. But what are the ingredients that enable these startups to be successful? Ambassador? Uh, yes, thank you. In, in Estonian case, and I think it applies to other countries as well probably, it's, it's so important that this, uh, you have created the uh, environment which is uh, inspiring, innovative, which is not uh, hindering the business at uh, at, at the early stage, which includes and encourages to get academia and uh, research uh, solutions to, on board, uh, which uh, encourages the, uh, the government sector to be open-minded and to change regulations when it needed. To Estonia has many uh, cases where we open our country or our capital Tallinn as a testbed for different solutions just to on, uh, regarding AI in, in transport or, or other areas in, in the health sector as well. So this is, I think, uh, this, uh, there are so many components in, uh, where, you, where government can bring forward. But uh, it, was, it was mentioned, the financing, I think that's also smart. Uh, smart investors are very important. In, in Estonian case, uh, what has created sort of positive energy to this is, has been our own success stories from Skype, from TransferWise, and these are all now, uh, these creators of these uh, uh, revolutionary uh, digital solutions at that, that day time, they are all now the, the investors to the uh, new startups. So this is the uh, continuation of, 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 of this, and I think that's very, this inspiration, uh, which I think is, is the key in this case. Thank you. Esther, I mean, you look at the landscape, you know, from a property developer's point of view, do you see the solutions that you need coming up or emerging? And do you think that there needs to be more support for these startups and these solutions? Well, definitely. When, I, when we first started, I mean, you and I have came a long way. When we first started, nobody talked to me about green building, you know, sustainability and all that. Only the last two years, we really see ESG or sustainability exploded into our, our, the mainstream. Whether political leader, you know, or business leader, investor, everybody talking about it. And I think uh, bringing people together, connecting people together to build an ecosystem is very important. It's like our sustainability academy. Not just it is, um, you know, a, a net zero building, a green building, to show it physically. And uh, we bring people together. It is actually um, a, a, a partnership, extensive partnership, that's supported by six government agencies. And uh, we, as a private sector, design and build it with 15 industry partners. And uh, Eco Business is also one of our partner, founding partner, with uh, UNDP. Uh, World Green Building Council, UN Global Compact, and we want to bring knowledge together, not just, you know, a physical platform, and we have extensive program. And uh, you may have the mindset, but you need a skill set. You can't just say that I want to change the world, save the world, and sitting there and do nothing. You need the skill set. You want to bring ideas together. You want to bring technologies together. So we actually partner with Sustainable Energy Association, with uh, ADB as the, uh, the partner, and then build capacity, bring technology from the developed nations and the economy, and you know, build capacity for the energy managers in Singapore and the ASEAN regions. And of course, we have incubator for SDG, which is uh, supported by uh, UNDP as well. And uh, basically, we want to invest in uh, startup, 
one to three years old, help them to give them rent-free space for them to not just have a physical space, but we connect them with investors, impact investors, and their mentors like us, that how we can help them to crystallize their thinking. Three of them are outside, you know, after us, please support them. And uh, we have no investment interest in that, but really want to support them and uh, with only with solutions and technologies and, you know, innovative, you know, mindset, you can really drive the, the you know, sustainability agenda and uh, like leaving no one behind. And one particular one, please visit them, is called Inspiring Girls. And uh, from primary school girls, we basically want to instill uh, confidence in them. And of course, we have our Women for Green Network also. Women can play a key role to drive sustainable, you know, <laughs> sustainable lifestyle at work, at place, and also, you know, at, at home as well, right? Thank you so much, Esther. I want to pick up on this uh, leave no one behind. And I think Riyadh had also mentioned that, you know, the digital divide is something very real and that we have to address this. And then if you look at how technology is, you know, displayed in, in, in the Hollywood movies and a lot of futuristic, it's always very dystopian. And I think that we cannot ignore that there is a fundamental level of distrust in some of these tools. And how do we then bridge that to ensure that these tools have the highest standards of governance and transparency and that it's inclusive? Ambassador, perhaps I can ask you. Yes, I think this is one of the aspects where I didn't mention or forgot to mention in our, our case. In Estonia, I think the trust towards the digital services has been extremely high throughout uh, uh, the years and it continues to be. It, it's as high as it can because uh, we also do uh, our parliamentary or local government voting online. So that shows the trust towards the system and to the services. But you're very right, it's extremely uh, uh, important. And that brings the other side of the coin, which is the uh, security of the system and cyber security, which I think is, is increasingly uh, increasing challenge if we want to uh, increase the trust towards the, the digital uh, systems. But I think the trust, what we experience, grows also through the usage. More people use and have positive experience, more people feel that it makes their life easier, it uh, frees their time to do something else. Uh, I think that these are also, also very, this is also a very important part of building trust towards digital services. Esther, any comments quick on this? Digital solutions are very important and uh, we are living in a very transparent world. So, you know, um, data is very important. So for us, we calculate every kilowatt hour and how we use it and tenants and then our contractors, the so-called scope 3 and body carbon. So there are a lot of things we could do to track performance. You must set target, track performance and also disclose. And uh, that is what investors are looking at. If you don't uh, satisfy all these, you will not have access to you know, the funding. And uh, afterwards, so one more, uh, AMPD Energy is outside, which actually is a game changing. For construction um, uh, uh, you know, site, we traditionally always rely on diesel to power the activities. With this new technology, and uh, they use uh, energy storage system, it actually uh, very successful and we have piloted it over the last almost a year in our construction site. It has actually proven to save, uh, reduce uh, uh, carbon emission by 85% and also save costs, 23% cost saving. So it's going to be a game changer. And uh, it also proved that with digital and technology, it, there is a strong business case. You can do well and do good at the same time. Thank you so much, Esther. With an eye on the time, I know this is a very short fireside chat. I want to just wrap up with the final question. If you had a magic wand, uh, what would be the one thing you'd like to see happen that will accelerate or move the needle on digital adoption for a green recovery? Ambassador. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one at the moment. I think the, the wand I want, I want the, the war in, in Ukraine to stop and leave the world to deal with the digital challenge and climate challenge and not to create more and more uh, challenges what we have. What we talked at, at the moment uh, today, I think we should concentrate on them, but unfortunately, this situation creates more and more challenges. So my, my, my wish is this war to end first. Well, very well said. Yeah. Totally agree. I think just two words, alignment and action. 
yeah, and uh, to, to create a world that we want. On that very positive note, please join me to thank our two distinguished speakers for a really insightful fireside chat. Thank you, speakers. And I'll hand it over to Vivian. All right, next, um, we will now zoom in on the digital innovation and putting these ideas into practice, right? After we heard Riyad, we heard um, Ambassador Turk and Esther talk about all these uh, potential for digital. Um, now, next, let's really talk about how we can put these ideas into practice. Um, our speakers will be having a conversation about shaping digital innovation ecosystems for a green recovery. So we're delighted to have Jessica again as our moderator. Thank you so much, Jessica. And she will now be joined by Mr. Gary Lowe, Ms. Genevieve Ding, Ms. Pei Chin Tae, and Ms. Sin Yi Lim. So while our speakers take their stage, uh, take the stage and take their seat, um, free sitting, it's okay. <laughs> free sitting. I'll be introduced them as I'll be introducing them as well. Thank you. So, alongside with Jessica, we have Mr. Gary Lowe. He's the founder and chief executive officer of uh, Dimito, a global agri-food trade solution digitalizing food supply chains for data visibility and trade financing using blockchain, AI, and IoT. Ms. Genevieve Ding is the head of sustainability policy for the Asia-Pacific region in Japan at Amazon Web Services. AWS provides on-demand cloud computing APIs to individuals and enterprises, including sustainability solutions such as carbon tracking, energy conservation, and waste reduction. We also have Ms. Pei Chin Tae, who's the policy lead for the Digital Government Unit at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. The Tony Blair Institute supports governments in building open, inclusive, and prosperous societies. And last but not least, we have Ms. Sin Yi Lim, who's the Executive Director for Sustainability and Agricultural Impact at Pintuotuo. Pintuotuo is a Chinese technology platform focused on agriculture, connecting farmers and distributors with consumers directly through its interactive shopping experience. All right, um, I'll pass it over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vivian. I have the privilege of moderating the second panel, and I'm very excited because we've heard from Ambassador as well as Esther and Riyadh about the challenges that we've seen globally and how the pandemic has really impacted us. And I think on this panel, we really want to deep dive into the ecosystems and the change that we're seeing on the ground. And perhaps, you know, on this um, thread, I can start with the operating environment. And I think, you know, we've spoken a lot about how the policy frameworks and the regulation really need to be there. And Genevieve, I know this is an expertise, expertise of yours, so I'm going to um, ask you the first question, which is that AWS has obviously, you know, been a leading player driving digitalization. I know your cloud services have been gearing towards net zero and enabling, you know, a digitalization that's inclusive. How has the operating environment been you know, for a company like yours, and are there any gaps in the policy that we really need to be addressing? Thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you so much, UNDP, for having me. It really is an honor to be on this panel, especially with uh, my fellow female uh, panelists, my male panelists as well. <laughs> it's, it's just been um, a real honor. So thanks for your question. And I think there's so much that digitalization and decarbonization um, can do together. So at AWS, we firmly believe that cloud technology can play a critical role in both accelerating digital transformation across economies, as well as decarbonization and promoting a green economic recovery. Um, we really think that this happens not just because of cloud service providers decarbonizing our own energy footprint by making our data centers more efficient, but also in helping our customers decarbonize their own operations. And I'll give you some examples of that. Um, Bamboo is a robot advisory um, service player in Singapore, and they have a product called Sustainability Insights. Leveraging cloud technology, they're actually enabling ESG considerations to be part of the investment-making decision process. Right? And we also have companies like Maxion, which is a solar, innovation company in Singapore, but they have operations in over 100 countries, and they're using cloud-enabled technology to optimize their operations as well so that they can focus on innovation. And beyond that, actually, we see that we're not just helping customers decarbonize their own footprint, 
we're helping customers help their customers decarbonize across their sectors beyond their own footprint. And we see this especially in the utility and power sector, where we see companies such as Trendy in Japan, Vector in New Zealand and Australia, or Greenco in India, help decarbonize the national grids through levering technology. And some of the policy gaps, um, I would say is first, the IP uh, C has recognized the immense potential for renewable energy to mitigate climate change. And AWS's investments in utility scale, renewable energy projects in Australia, Japan, Singapore, and China um, play to that. Unfortunately, Asia Pacific region is still one of the most challenging places in the world for access to 100% corporate procurement of renewable energy. And this is due to limited availability in the region, um, undue costs, high costs, and regulatory complexity. So we really feel that one of the policy gaps could be to encourage and accelerate the adoption of corporate procurement of renewable energy by facilitating and making more conducive the regulatory and policy frameworks for renewable energy. And just very quickly, the second thing that we could do is also to remove barriers to cloud adoption, especially in regulated sectors like the energy sector, telecoms, or the financial sector, which hold immense potential for decarbonizing. And cloud technology and technology generally can really accelerate sustainability innovation. Thanks a lot, Genevieve. I think, you know, you've really highlighted an important part in this region, you know, being so different in so many ways and the access to energy markets in order for us to decarbonize the systems is still not quite there yet. Um, Gary, I want to, to, you know, come to you because you're leveraging blockchain for supply chain traceability and, you know, you have a decentralized model um, and, you know, crypto is obviously the most um, in thing right now, but it's obviously the newest thing and regulation is kind of catching up. How has the policy environment been for you? Um, first of all, we use AWS, so should, should have used eMuto as one of the clients as well. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, the blockchain that we've been doing is more for uh, small farmers to packing houses that is bringing uh, items from mainly agriculture perishables. And I think to do this, before we can get anything on the cloud, we needed to make sure that we have the hardware to make sure that they have the equipment to put it on the cloud. And to put things on the cloud, you have 3G, 4G, no G. You know, you got Wi-Fi, no Wi-Fi, online, offline. And then to be able to send a digital, uh, physical digital twin, all right? You got a physical product, and then you need to have a digital twin onto the platform. So this is where we have actually used uh, AWS for a lot of the cloud work. But I've thought the blockchain side of the game is to really change the way the business is actually operated. In the agri-business, I think Ping Toto will probably talk about it more, it's a, it's a very siloed business. So what happens at a farm or what happens at a packing house and as it goes down the supply chain, a lot of us have our own system, but there is no system for us to sort of cut across that information. And, and this is sort of like the way we use the blockchain. We have used uh, blockchain in a way where first it's immutable, and I think when you say immutable means you don't, you can't change what you put up. And then the way we've done it is as well, the blockchain isn't what we call the next best thing to slice bread. We didn't use blockchain to error proof the trade. We actually use blockchain to prove the error of the trade. So in the sense that now you sort of like make that mistake, you just can't blame it on your clerical staff, right? And say that somebody sent you the wrong stuff. It's sort of like you did the wrong thing, then what is the right thing that was actually supposed to be done? And we timestamp everything on the blockchain. Now, the, the second part for us is to really understand uh, blockchain as one where you can now open up certain information. Because in, in, in the world of trading and the world of trade, there's a lot of priority that we want to sort of like keep our data, who our suppliers are, who do we sell to, who do we engage. There's a lot of business intelligence in there. So when you have platforms that say, oh, let's do this for the good of the world, I think it's not going to come very naturally because there's too many commercial data. So when we use blockchain, it's really to ensure that it allows you to share the kind of data and a lot of things are actually hash. Uh, we, we, don't, we have not gone into the world of uh, crypto yet. I think for us is to really use the green finance approach to ensure that the trades that we are financing is to be able to see uh, the kind of movement, for example, the avocados from Mexico all the way to Singapore or to China. Then we can actually then use the amount of water use, 
the, the fertilizers, the, the kind of uh, pesticides used, as well as the carbon footprint. And, and now we're going into each uh, box, right? So it's all like you go into the panet, panet to the carton, to the pallet, to the container, and then all the way to the consumer in itself. So that's sort of like what we've been doing. And of course, the last part is to add AI to it, right? So that's uh, the kind of work that we've been doing. And regulatory part of it has been one big challenge. I think like what Genevieve says, we were operating in Asia. Every country has their own way, way and standards. And every country is trying to put that is some form of a barrier. And sometimes people don't understand that barriers doesn't have to be um, one where they disclose in policy. Sometimes a, a trade restriction, and an example, Chinese apples cannot be sent directly to the port in Jakarta. Chinese apples have to travel all the way to Surabaya to be unloaded, and then it's trucked across Java to now be sold into Jakarta. So if you want to track the carbon footprint, that, that, that's, that's a lot, right? But these are the kind of uh, restrictions and policies that sometimes it's not very obvious, right? So for us, I think we're using this uh, system and blockchain to probably help us guide the way operations for different companies have, have been using it and then maybe use it to sort of like go past certain policies or certain countries' requirements. Right. Super fascinating. Thank you, Gary. I think that, uh, you know, that example is really exemplifying how you can improve transparency, governance and better decision making. I remember that uh, I was at a World Economic Forum in May for the annual meeting and I attended this session on space exploration. And one of the questions on the moderator is like, we have so many problems here on Earth. Why are we putting billions into space? And one of the startups, uh, Planet Labs, was saying that actually the space technology we're seeing now is able to track deforestation at a very, very minute level, is able to track trade flows, is able to track the carbon footprint. And, you know, I think that is a, a, a point that I wanted to mention because it can be a force for so much good. But what do we do with it, I think is the other question. And perhaps, Peijin, you know, that is a good segue into your perspective at uh, the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Um, we've talked about governments playing a key role to conversations around policy and regulation. So um, what, you know, are governments, I guess, how, do, how are they thinking about how do you regulate this sector? How do you empower uh, the adoption of digital tools? Yes, um, thank you for having me on the panel. Um, it's really great to see such a full room. Um, and I think that before I answer that question, I think the, the, the pressing question is that as we emerge from the pandemic, what is the most important lesson learned uh, for governments, for digital governments? Um, one of the OECD reports last year talked about, um, you know, the biggest lesson that governments um, have learned, should learn, um, is that they need to respond to a future crisis with greater speed and scale, uh, whilst maintaining trust and transparency. And indeed, uh, I mean, some of the speakers mentioned about trust um, earlier on, um, and I think this is so sort of foundational to any digital transformation efforts. Um, trust all around the world has been declining uh, when it comes to trust in public institutions. Um, Singapore and probably Estonia are some of the outliers, I would say. Um, and one of the key drivers for trust is that of competency. So governments are deemed to be competent when they deliver services that meet citizens' needs. Indeed, um, our institute's uh, globalism study that was uh, released earlier this year um, in collaboration with University of Cambridge um, highlighted the close relationship between trust in technology and trust in governments. In the UK, for example, um, there is generally you know, poor trust, a low trust, uh, not surprisingly, um, in government. However, there is stronger trust uh, in healthcare institutions and banks. So people would rather trust banks than governments. Um, and um, a correlation to that is, uh, you know, people were more willing to trust um, a health pass rather than a digital ID in the UK. So we can really see the very strong uh, relationship between um, adoption in technology and the level of trust in government. So with that understanding, what is it that governments need to do? Um, in order to restore, rebuild trust, uh, there are several ways in which technology can support um, and governments need to look at more innovative ways in which they um, engage the public um, and doing so will help them to sort of unlock um, opportunities um, for uh, 
deliberative uh, participation and take, undertaking more uh, participatory approach towards um, policy making. And technology can be a real enabler here in terms of uh, reducing barriers to scale, uh, barriers to experimentation, collaboration, um, and iteration. And uh, last but not least, um, bringing all these uh, closer to home. Uh, one of the quotes that I really love about the Singapore government is that uh, they, I can't remember which minister said this, but um, it was something around you know, in order to effectively deal with complex challenges, the answer lies not in growing the public sector, but growing the partnerships with people. And I think this is a fundamental way in which uh, governments all around the world um, can leverage on technology to harness um, yeah, trust. Thanks very much, Peijin. I think that quote uh, is, is very apt. And I think, you know, the pandemic has also shown the role of technology in helping to control, you know, the virus and information and things like that. And we've had a whole debate in Singapore around Trace Together and its transparency and all that. But without that trust in these tools, um, I don't think we can achieve the level of mass cooperation that's needed to respond to these crises. So, so thanks very much for that. I want to come to see Ni now. Um, and I think that, you know, at Pintodor, you have a very interesting um, challenge in terms of getting farmers connected to the digital economy. Obviously, you know, when we talk about the digital divide, um, there are many, many hard-to-reach communities. Um, and Gary talked about the hardware. So how are you, um, you know, kind of connecting the farmers? And what were some of the challenges that you faced and how did you overcome them? Thanks, Jessica, and thanks to UNDP for having me here. Um, I think, you know, Gary made a lot of very important points around the importance of hardware. So uh, before I go into the details, uh, just a brief, you know, one-liner about Pinduoduo, because many outside of China may not have heard of us. We're an e-commerce marketplace that was founded in 2015. Today, we're connecting over 800 million consumers on one end to over 16 million farmers on the other. So we operate only in China at the moment. Um, we are very much focused on agricultural products, even though we sell all categories of goods. And when we were founded in 2015, you know, that was back in, back in the day, you know, nobody really had uh, you know, thought of actually buying or selling agricultural products online. But what our founding team saw was that actually a lot of the ground conditions were ripe for such a transformation to take place. Because after a decade plus of investment, the logistics infrastructure was already becoming much more reliable. You could now get a box of perishable products from one point to another with a very you know, reliable time frame. You could also get information across to people very efficiently through WeChat right, and all the uh, you know, available apps online. So we started out life as a WeChat mini program. And it's a way for people to connect with each other as well. So both on the consumer end, as well as the farmer end. So that was actually very instrumental in helping to lead the digitization of agricultural product sales. Because on one hand, you know, we were able to let the farmers see in a very tangible way, okay, this is, this is what it is, right? These are your customers. These are the orders coming in live. And that's giving them a degree of connection to the market that they never had before. Because you know, in most traditional kind of agricultural food supply chains, the farmer is actually receiving only a very small fraction of what the end consumer actually pays. And the farmer doesn't even see the product make it all, all the way there, right? It usually goes through multiple layers of distributors. You know, what the farmer gets paid, uh, say, you know, one RMB for, for you know, half a kilogram of garlic, by the time it makes its way to the consumer in Shanghai, they're paying eight RMB for that half a kilogram of garlic. And all that markup in between is going to uh, you know, the intermediaries, the people driving the trucks, etc. So what digital is, you know, digital um, information or digitization of this whole process is enabling us to do is basically to connect the farmers more directly to the consumers. And that sounds like, okay, you know, it's a no-brainer, but back in 2015, I think one key part is demonstrating to the farmers that this thing would work, right? No one has done it before. And a key part of it is because agricultural products by themselves, you know, most of them are fairly low value. It's a high volume, low value kind of proposition. So how do we aggregate that volume? And I think that was one of the key innovations that we had with the team purchase, which was that we were able to use those digital tools through WeChat, get the consumers to aggregate their orders through a team purchase, the consumer is enjoying a lower price. So maybe they're paying you know, 15 RMB for the box of oranges versus 20 RMB by themselves. And on the other hand, the farmer is seeing massive volumes accumulating in a very short period of time. 
So that gives them the certainty that like, wow, okay, this is real. And these numbers are, are snowballing and they're growing very rapidly. So I think one is that kind of, you know, buy-in both on the consumer end as well as the farmer end. And I think the other big piece to support it, to take it all the way to where we are today, is really around education and you know, bringing on board younger people who can mobilize their fellow villagers, giving them training online, offline, in person. How do you run a business? You know, how do you do a live stream? How do you sell products well? How do you handle customer service? And all of that has to be kind of stitched together right, so that we can actually move an entire community along, not just one individual farmer. And we've seen that ripple effect over you know, the last uh, you know, six plus years as we've grown. So I would say that was a very key part of uh, you know, getting the journey started and moving all of the farmers into a digital economy. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating example and really, really interesting. Um, perhaps it's a good point to then ask this question around SMEs. I think, you know, a lot of companies who are listed or much bigger, they have the financial muscle and the resources to do digitalization and execute a digital strategy. But the large swathe of the population, you know, from farmers to small, medium enterprises, they might not have the same access to these resources. Perhaps, Gary, I can get you to share your thoughts. Um, you know, how do we enable greater access or accessibility of these digital offerings for this community? Yeah, that's a great question. So one, one of the reasons that Dimoto was started is fundamentally we run, a, I'll consider myself an SME kind of a company, which is about 100 million turnover, which is not really internationally. In Singapore, it's not a small company, right? But in international, it's still considered small. So a lot of these are family-owned companies that ranges between 1 million of turnover to 10 million to 100 million. So they categorize themselves as a small, medium enterprise. Now, to go and say we have to spend, say, 50,000 to 100,000 on blockchain technology, uh, like we had a call, just call one of the bigger firms just to get a consultant down to our Thailand operation. It was like, oh, that would cost us about 50000 So, you know, it, it's sort of like no-brainer. We couldn't even start. So for Dimuto, we started with a, uh, a subscription model. It ranges between 1000 to $2,000 a month to get the whole platform online. And then for the farmers, it's actually the packing house that's working directly with a, the with a packing house. And it's probably like $10 a month. So this, this is a way to basically put that inclusiveness, right? Because cost is definitely one of those things where everybody wants traceability, but nobody wants to pay for it. So, so a lot of the things that we are trying to get out from should not be at the expense of the farmers, for example, or the smaller owners. It really is about the inefficiencies. Uh, one example is if you talk about uh, supermarkets, they have a very high markup. But to be very honest, if you really look at the net profit of a supermarket, it's actually very low. So, so where, where did this markup go in the supermarket level? A lot of it goes into food waste, right? So, so imagine now, uh, I was just telling Ambassador an example where we had uh, uh, containers in Singapore where we had to discard eight containers of grapes because the people who packed it in Greece sent us some things that we couldn't accept and it was all thrown away. Now, if we could see what was being packed before you even ship, then a lot of this food waste will not have happened. So I think cost is one factor that we, we want to make sure that there is a lot of savings of these inefficiencies and that transparency and the trust that is what's needed in our economy. But to get this uh, out to the small and medium enterprises, I think we, we want to make sure that it's affordable and actually it's the savings and the disputes, right? that we basically can get into because you say, I send you this, but you say, I didn't receive this. And then you, you start arguing and, and there's a lot of money in there. So we, we think that the best way to go about is try to get the operational efficiencies and get that savings back. In Fascinating. Thank you. Genevieve, I mean, AWS, you know, is, is targeting SMEs as part of your offerings. How are you making your um, digital products more accessible to them? Yeah, absolutely. So cloud technology is one of the best advantages of that is that it's very low barriers to entry. Instead of needing your own physical hardware and infrastructure, you can now leverage cloud-hosted services and tools to innovate and to accelerate, um, to accelerate progress. And we see that actually from SMEs to startups who can't afford that high startup um, upfront capex costs. And we see that even in farmers. So I, I think it's great that we have examples today from the agricultural um, sector and, I, and um, countries like Thailand and Pakistan, for instance, after farmers adopted cloud enabled services and technologies in order to monitor weather conditions and crop conditions, they actually reported a 50% increase in yield 
and an associated 40% increase in profitability. And these are farmers in remote areas who don't have access to hardware, but because they leveraged cloud-hosted technologies and services, they were able to do so. And I think it would be great as well if the government um, can subsidize and incentivize the adoption of cloud technologies through, um, by SMEs. And I think that would be a great push as well. Thank you very much. I want to move the conversation a little more to the education part of it, because obviously for digital tools to work, citizens need to understand how they work. There must be a level of trust. I think we've talked about that. And maybe, Peyton, I can get you to share, you know, what have, what have you seen that's worked and not worked in terms of enabling, you know, literacy in digital tools and education around this ecosystem? So we had um, we launched a education report um, earlier in the year where we set out to resolve what we call the education trilemma, which is the relationship between cost, quality, and scale. Simply put, uh, not enough schools are being uh, built to meet global demand. One of the SDG uh, goals, um, and although funding is on the rise, it is still insufficient. So how do we sort of unlock this trilemma and uh, use technology to perhaps resolve um, this sort of uh, deadlock? So first of all, we will look at uh, how funding has been used uh, so far and um, drawing on the um, OECD and uh, World Bank um, statistical evidence, uh, we found that um, although certain level of funding is correlated to student performance, um, it is only up to about USD 5 to 7K per student per year, adjusted for purchasing parity. And um, any funding uh, per student per year beyond uh, that level um, is not necessarily going to yield much better outcomes. So which means that whatever funding that we have globally needs to be spent better. And we talk a, uh, uh, quite a bit about human-centered design, but I think that there is also a need to sort of zoom out and to look at the, the problem from a sort of systems perspective to understand how different um, actors within the system work together or work against each other. Um, so some of the very uh, common uh, problems that we uh, looked at um, in the education system was around the types of investment that were being made. Um, very often, and this is rather unfortunate, that um, some of the schools, they invest in technology equipment, but uh, teachers and students were not sufficiently upskilled. So they would lock away these computers in the IT lab in case students or, or, or teachers break them. So that is not a sort of a productive way of, of investment. So in order to offer um, different uh, lands um, towards this solution, uh, towards this problem, uh, we developed uh, what we call the minimum viable education framework, where we looked at some of the, the key dimensions of education system, including infrastructure, um, the system itself, parents and carers, learners and teachers and um, advocate for funders and principals to look at how they might achieve um, a sort of a baseline um, level of uh, capacity before moving on to the next one. Um, simply put, you, you have to spread out your investment um, in your system and not just you know, put all your eggs um, in one basket. Thank you very much. I will look up that report later. It sounds very interesting. Um, perhaps I could come to Xin Yi. I mean, how has Pindodo approached this issue of education and digital literacy, especially as you know, the, your target audience, I suppose, you know, has quite a lot of challenges around that? Sure. So I think when it comes to um, you know, trying to reach out to the farmers and uh, basically introduce them to selling online, I think it's a constant partnership, actually, with the local governments. Um, because they are very important in terms of actually helping to ensure that the, the farmers kind of stay on track, right? Like if we introduce, say, um, an agronomist to share some growing um, you know, tips with them, for instance, it's the, the local governments that actually work together with the agronomists uh, to then ensure that, okay, you know, these uh, steps are being taken and, okay, they are you know, selling the things well on Pinduoduo, etc. And we also have been nurturing a group of what we call new farmers. So since 2015, we've trained about 126,000 new farmers and we're committed to training another 100,000 more. And these are younger people who generally you know, have had some education. They want to go back to their hometowns and kind of be a, you know, an entrepreneur. And they serve a very important role in terms of actually bringing in the rest of the community uh, on this digital journey. So what we've seen is that actually for some of the uh, you know, people who traditionally may get left out in a farming-centric community, right? Those who don't have the ability to do physical labor, for instance. Now they can be roped in to, you know, do live streaming 
They can do some packing or distribution on the side. Um, so that's also been very encouraging. And I think fundamental to, to you know, this whole discussion around ensuring the, the fruits or, or you know, ensuring that education actually reaches the people that we're trying to help is actually thinking about kind of incentives, right? So again, if we can demonstrate to farmers in a very tangible way, they can see for themselves, and that's the beauty of digital technologies, they can see on their smartphone, I did this, this is the result. This is how my sales have changed, right? So that is a very direct feedback loop um, that I think helps to reinforce the learnings that we're trying to impart, whether it's in terms of agronomy, growing better products, or in terms of you know, selling better online as well. I want to touch on the footprint of the digital hardware, and perhaps I can get Genevieve to you know, share your views. Obviously, with digitalization, we're using a lot more resources. We're having a debate around deep sea mining and whether we need to go and mine the deep sea for things like cobalt and lithium and things like that. How are we thinking about the digitalization of our economies in a way that also thinks about the footprint of these tools that we need? So that's definitely a challenge that um, governments and the private sector are thinking about as well. But actually, we see that with innovations and energy efficiency, the energy use and associated carbon emissions actually can, can remain minimal. So the International Energy Agency published a report last year which showed that um, <clears throat> despite the massive increase in demand for compute and storage, actually the data center industry's use of energy has remained virtually flat since 2010. That means despite the massive growth in demand for digital technologies over the past 12 years, energy use has stayed the same. And this is in large part because of the huge investments that hyperscale data centers have made in improving the energy efficiency of their data centers, but also because we've seen migration from less efficient on-premise data centers to more efficient hyperscale data centers. And I think as long as technology advancements and the willingness and the commitment to improve energy efficiency increases, we'll continue to see such um, improvements. Um, on top of that, if you layer on the procurement of renewable energy, um, that will yield even greater energy efficiency. So a report last year by 451 Research showed that on-premise data centers, well, actually hyperscale data centers are five times more efficient than on-premise data centers. So by moving workloads from on-premise data centers to hyperscale data centers, you actually reduce your energy use and associate carbon emissions by up to 80%. If you layer on the procurement of renewable energy, the carbon reduction opportunity is actually over 93%. And I, I think it's, there's so much potential in what technology can do. Um, and I think we have to remember that cloud technologies and data centers provide the backbone to digitalization um, that, really, that really drive the economy. So we can't go back to a pre-digital age what we can do is to innovate and to think outside of the box to make what we use more efficient. Thanks a lot for that, Gary. I mean, blockchain has been in the limelight for its energy usage. I mean, is this something that you are addressing? Yeah, well, thank, thank goodness the AWS is solving that problem for us, right? We're not looking more on that side of the game. I think where we're looking more is on, for example, uh, climate control uh, agriculture, or what we call it is like, it's not really just greenhouse, it's not vertical farms, but greenhouses. So where, where we are looking at is like, how do we make sure that the, the water use, for example, or the carbon footprint of some of the agriculture products. Um, for example, I was just saying over lunch today, it takes a lot of water just to grow one um, avocados, right? Actually, you'd be surprised. One avocado consumes what you drink in 10 years, or one avocado, right? So now, when you, when you think about it, the amount of water that's used to deliver the food we eat is, is one huge resource drain. And if you talk about climate uh, control environment, uh, this is where you put vertical farms and you put uh, trays above the ground rather than using ground to grow the soil. So you can actually use compost and different methods to actually measure the water use as well as energy use. A, a lot of this can be something that we are focusing on. Uh, we didn't focus on the blockchain side of the game, but we are really focusing on how all this little data, as you, as you can imagine, if I can count one avocado with 1,800 gallons of water, then imagine one box, imagine one pallet or one container, and I move a lot of containers of this. Right, so these this are kind of like the little things or resources that in the past, it is used to be just one pen that says, I want to order two containers of avocado. We, we never had a place to measure the resources used to deliver that. Right? And, and what we normally talk about is 
the uh, benefit of avocados, you know, the, the fats and everything that's healthy to make you think. We don't, we don't talk about how much resources that we are draining California water or Chilean water or the carbon footprint that we have created just to get this, right? So, so maybe that's kind of like the areas, maybe the conversation has to also change the way the consumer eats, right? That there is other ways that they can actually help and, and to have the ability to see that when you do eat something, it, it, for us, not just China farmers, because we, we deal with a lot, the Southeast Asians, the Peruvians, Chileans, the South Africans. So th there are a lot of people doing different things. And what we wanted to do is to make sure that at least we can capture those kind of data in the different, different uh, areas. And then this can then make you think about whether you eat an avocado from Mexico or whether it's coming from Australia. It will make a bit of a difference. Right? Uh, and the strain on that community where you're buying it from. Thank you very much, Gary. With just two minutes to go, I'd like to wrap up the discussion with the final question, and that really is bring it back to the green recovery theme that we have today. Um, and what is the one thing that you want to see that you think will enable a quicker, um, I guess, sustainable and green recovery using digitalization? Uh, Cindy, perhaps you can go first. Sure. I think it's a little hard to narrow down to one thing, so I'll say two. So I think one is just greater partnerships. We've seen um, the opportunity for uh, you know, private sector, public sector, academia to all come together to really make a very big impact with regards to our agri-food ecosystem. And um, I think the other piece is actually you know, bringing in younger generations. So that's going to be critical to ensuring that whatever we're doing today carries over into the future. And they have to be part of that conversation as well to ensure that, you know, we are co-creating a shared future together. I like that. Thank you. So I just wanted to end off by saying that uh, we'd like to see more um, inclusive and sustainable digital transformation within governments because digital government isn't just good government. It makes for more resilient government. And I think the case is, is, is very clear in the case, um, when we look at how the Ukrainian government has been ramping up their digitalization efforts um, in helping to build resilience in the country. Thank you. Genevieve? I think putting people first, um, Riyadh spoke about it late, um, earlier, digital transformations cannot leave people behind. They really need to be front and center of, of digital um, advancement and, and progress. So I think a big part of that is training. I think if we can ensure that no one is left behind through training and digital skills, it means that everyone will be able to take advantage of digital progress. Thank you. And Gary, yeah. the last for, word. For me, probably, the, the wish is, I think, to do more of this kind of conversation. I think, I thank UNDP for inviting a fruit seller to come here and talk about fruits. And, and we're not academia, we are not, uh, another fruit seller over there, right? We get, we're getting the fruit sellers and getting the inclusiveness to be, to be part of the conversation. I think government leading it and of course academia leading it, it's definitely very important. But I think the private sector do have some work that we do do, but sometimes we don't show that enough that we can't share. I think that's probably another part that I, I, I think we can do it. Thank you very much, Gary. So we've heard you know, many insights from this panel, everything from policy gaps, what governments need to do more of. We've heard about the need for trust and how we really need to be building this. And also on the innovation that we're seeing and the digital literacy uh, that's so important as well. So thank you so much for this really, really interesting panel. Please join me to thank the speakers. <laughs> Learned so much. Thank you. We still have one more fireside chat to go before uh, we have our very special guest who will be doing the closing address uh, for this afternoon. So uh, there will be uh, we will be joined with uh, Mr. Aaron Maniam, who's the Deputy Secretary of Ministry of uh, Communications and Information. Later on, he will be close doing the closing address and sharing with us a little bit of how we can leverage digital to drive sustainable um, action and also the 2030 agenda. And, uh, so that's what that's coming up next. Um, all right. So uh, can we also now invite, um, you know, on what Genevieve was talking about, it's about leaving no one behind. So on this note, uh, we do want to explore what are priorities for an inclusive and green digital economy. We're delighted to have again with us Mr. Riyad, uh, the Interim Director at the UNDP Global Centre, and also Dr. Min Tan. Um, can we have uh, both of them on stage, please? Riyadh and um, Ming, thank you. 
So Dr. Ming Tan is the executive director for, of the Tech for Good Institute. The Tech for Good Institute is a non-profit think tank dedicated to advancing research on the use of digital in Southeast Asian societies for economic empowerment. Let's give a one more round of applause to Ming and Riyadh. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Ming Tan. It's a real pleasure having you today. So I have my colleague who prepared very difficult questions that I have to ask you. So if you don't like them, it's not my problem. It's Ganda who is hiding there <laughs> behind the plant. If you like them, it's me. Thank you very much. Uh, we've seen the emergence of two overarching global trends since COVID-19. One raising consciousness regarding sustainability-related issues. Second, a renewed push for digitalization. What are your thoughts on the relationship between these two words, particularly on how the later digitalization could catalyze the former sustainability? Thank you. Hi, thank you, Riyadh. Thank you, Gandra. I've only seen Ganda about this big on a screen, so it's really nice, and thank you, UNDP, and everybody for being here. Well, as you mentioned, key di digitalization has been a key transition um, of this decade, and certainly over the last two years. And Southeast Asia technology has and will continue to drive growth. Um, Google estimates that 40 million people entered the digital economy just over the last two years, and almost all of them on the mobile phone. So really, really, really intimate and really fast and really quite unique compared to the, tra the trajectory of digital uh, growth compared to other countries. Now at the Tech for Good Institute, we believe that this trajectory can also and has to be sustainable, inclusive and equitable. Um, and you know, digitalization is a general enabling technology, right? It's a horizontal. So it's really funny when people talk about digital economy like it's a thing, when actually at the end of the day, every economy will be digitalized to some degree or another. Um, and so because of that, digitalization has a role to play in any other transition that we will see in our communities and in our economies and sustainability being key for that. And let me share why. Um, you know, the 2030 agenda calls for a global partnership to realize peace and prosperity uh, for people and the planet for now and into the future, right? It's super complex and what digitalization can help us do is to do us, help us do what we do now better and to help us do new things in new ways. And doing what we do better, first of all, is that we need data. And we've heard a lot about all the data whizzes and the smart people um, who know this a lot better than I do. We need data for goal setting. We need data for reporting and evaluation. We need data to gain efficiencies, um, to reduce information asymmetries, because that's where a lot of the power lies. And if we're looking at equitable growth, that information asymmetry is really important. And most importantly, we need data on shared metrics to see if we're actually bringing everybody along with us, as in your opening address. You know, second, the digital solutions allow us to do things differently, and that's really, really cool. And I'll give two examples, one on the S side, on the social side, and one on the E side, which is the environmental side. So on the S side, financial inclusion. There are 17 SDGs, and financial inclusion is seen as a driver of 13 of them. So massive. And we have, especially in Southeast Asia, a very large unbanked or underbanked population. And what you have with the digital financial services providers is that they can use alternative types of data to be able to build credit models for people who have no collateral, right? I think there is this old saying that banks lend money to people who actually have the collateral. Banks lend money to people who don't really need it but then now, data is the new collateral because they have this whole picture of you from your transactions, from your, uh, the way in which you buy and sell, if you're a smallholder farmer, 
they have a sense of how likely you're willing to repay. And therefore, the digital financial service providers are able to serve the unbanked in a completely different way that traditional banks can't, along very, very different risk models. Um, the Tech for Good Institute released a report last year on the platform economies and in digital finance. And it was interesting, micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, MSMEs, um, who, were le who were borrowing from digital financial service providers, three quarters, 75% of them had never been able to get a loan from a traditional bank, which means the only other source of credit are basically informal, which are like loan sharks, right? So they're doing things in a completely different way. On the environmental side, you can use cloud sense, you can use sensing technologies and cloud to do things in a completely different way. And this is not super global. We have local examples. There is a great Indonesian startup called eFishery, and they use sensing technologies to automate fish feeding. And the problem with a lot of these um, great big uh, solutions is that they, the small MSMEs tend to be very underserved. I think Pintuoto had mentioned that, you know, they don't often have the solutions available to them. And so eFisheries has these smart feeders. They see how fish just quickly the fish swim, and therefore it means they're really, really hungry. And then they feed them just enough. You reduce labor, you reduce cost, because feed is 90% of the cost of, in a fish farm, and you also reduce the nitrogen, excess nitrogen because of excess fish. They are in about 70,000 fish and shrimp ponds across Indonesia right now, and they're making a massive difference on the social and on the environmental side, allowing us to do things completely differently. So sorry, bottom line, long, long answer to a short, you know, so a long answer to a short question is that digitalization and sustainability have to be the basic operating assumptions for any business, whether they're big or small, whether they're established or startup, moving forward. Thank you very much, and thank you especially for the three words, data, inclusion, environment. Second question, digital platforms are an underlying feature of the digital economy, but such platforms come with often overseen challenges. Could you please share insight from your research at the Institute on the opportunities and pitfalls of digital platform from different stakeholders? Sure, um, and I'm so happy to have followed the panel before because all of them, are, I think almost all of them are platform companies in a way, AWS, etc. And I think it's quite important to think about who's using these platforms. And you have the merchants on one end or the sellers on one end, and then you have the consumers on the other end, right? So on the merchants, many of them are these MSMEs, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. In Southeast Asia, there's something like 71 million of them. To be honest, hand on heart, I think there are a lot more because many of them aren't even registered as companies, right? It's me and my daughter running a warung. We're not registered as a company. There's no firm level data on this. And they, Platforms allow them to enter the digital economy, whether it's with AWS, like Genevieve had mentioned, they don't need to set up a server, they're online. Whether it's using Google to reach their first customers, set up a web page, or whether it's using Grab or Food Panda or Pinduoduo to reach customers, that's their first step into, into the digital economy. Um, and platforms, therefore, have a very interesting sustainability challenge, especially for online to offline platforms. Um, I think AWS and the information platforms like Google and Facebook have their own challenges. But for online to offline platforms, their impact, whether positive or negative, are very much realized through actors that they can't really control, stakeholders like the merchants and like the consumers. So when you have your um, but they can use this to their advantage too, because they can really incentivize action. So, for example, in the mobility space, um, you think about the carbon footprint, right? And what and the electrical vehicle, the EV agenda, is just getting held back because of the electrification of the grid, and there just aren't enough charging stations in many parts of Southeast Asia. So you have companies like Grab and Gojek who are partnering with Goguru and Patamina to just do, um, what do you call these, battery swaps, right? So the, the two-wheelers, the motorbikes, they get up to Indonesia, they just go up, they swap, they pop in a battery, 
they swap the battery, there's no downtime, no charging time, and therefore they can push the EV agenda much faster than waiting for the infrastructure to happen. And they do this with partners and they can incentivize that action. For consumers, it's also really interesting, especially for those where you are, um, they've got verticals, right? So uh, you use the same app for buying food, for transport, etc., and they can incentivize action amongst consumers. So if you're a food panda, I'm buying for maybe 50 different food. I, I know I use food, you know, I, I, I buy food a lot. And what you get is you have this little toggle, right? No plastic cutlery. And I think food panda managed to reduce or something like 160 million pieces of plastic cutlery by incentivizing that action or enabling that action so it becomes a no-brainer for, for myself or for any consumer when they're, using, you know, when they're using this. Grab, for example, has something called a personal impact report. So it can tell you through your choices in transport, through your choices in food delivery, through your choices in grocery delivery, etc., what your actual impact, and it great, gives great information, and that's the first step to building awareness. So I think platforms do have a role to play. Thank you. Thank you especially for this uh, raising the, the issue of how technology can help and impact uh, the protection of the environment. I would like to hear your thought on the future of artificial intelligence. How will AI impact green recovery, and should what policy maker be particularly aware of? Sure. If I was all right, I'll take that answer in two parts. The okay. first is about AI in general and the relationship with sustainability. And then the second is about how to govern that AI, right? So I think the first thing is we all know, everyone in the room, and everyone is here in the room because we know that sustainability is inherently complex. And you know, we talked about peace and prosperity for people and planet. You've got multiple objectives operating together in an interconnected way. You've got multiple stakeholders and you've got multiple timelines. You've got to deal with the now and then you have to deal with the future generations and you know, the future as well. We have to take immediate action and then you also have to think about the long downstream effects. And so you do need that systems approach to it and AI and digital technologies are uniquely suited to supporting this very complex challenge that's fed in with a lot of data. And let me give you two quick examples, again, one from the S and one from the E, um, the Universal Human Rights Index. And I just, uh, just as a guess, you know, how many human rights observations and recommendations are there out there globally? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Just globally? How many guidance and mechanisms are there? Because you're dealing with global supply chains, for example. So when you want to think about your human rights impact, you've got to think about it globally, right? Any guess? A thousand. Put up your hands. Two thousand. Five thousand. Ten thousand? One hand up there. There are 180,000 different observations and recommendations, which is crazy. I mean, any policymakers would just be paralyzed. And so the Universal Human Rights Index uses AI to show the links between the SDGs and all of this 180,000. If you want to select it by theme, you want to select it by country, you want to select it by um, types of people affected, right? You can actually then sort it. And they have to use AI and sort of language recognition to be able to understand that. So that's really fantastic because that facilitates analysis, programming, as well as evaluation. Uh, closer to home, we have a company called Mimosa Tech in Vietnam, and they use cloud smart sensing technologies to help farmers do better irrigation. And so AI is really able to take so many different data feeds and to be able to process them, to be able to give really sort of holistic information when it's done well. Now, when it comes to governance, that's a whole other issue. I talked about digital technologies being a sort of a horizontal, and AI and machine learning is the same thing. They're general enabling technologies, right? They're like the steam engine or the printing press, basically. And we don't regulate the printing press. We regulate newspapers, for example. And so the challenge is to assess the risk of whether such innovations that often come from companies 
how do they undermine the traditional trust institutions that we have, the governments, the banks, the police, etc. And, you know, I always say that when we think about regulating or governing AI, it's quite helpful to think about it in its use case. In banks, for example, in healthcare, what's that impact? So MAS, for example, has AI governance. MAS, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, has AI governance specifically for financial institutions. Um, in terms of risks, I think that one thing which is really un typical about any AI or any machine learning is the reliance on input data, right? You get a bad data set that you're training it on, you're gonna get a bad algorithm at the end of the day. And successful development and deployment and governance of AI applications has to take into account Southeast Asia's diversity. So we're 660 million people, we're an amazing market, but we also have 100 ethnic groups, we have 1,000 different languages, and so you, you really need local solutions. There is a great company in Indonesia called Kata.ai, and they use one of, they've created through NLP, Natural Language Processing, one of the most popular um, chatbots, yeah? And, you know, in Bahasa, there are like 13 different ways just to say I. And so if you have and, and so you really need fit for purpose data sets to be able to ensure that whatever AI uh, technology that comes out or algorithm is actually fit for purpose to serve the community or serve the segment that it's meant to serve. Thank you very much. Final question. Yanda, don't worry, everything would be okay. Are we okay? <laughs> okay. So, some of the early discussion touch upon the innovation from the private sector as well as uh, public sector. And ecosystem, as mentioned by uh, the ambassador of Estonia. Those ecosystem and innovation, they foster the digital innovation. The COVID-19 pandemic truly catalyzed digital innovation in many developing countries, including here in Southeast Asia. What according to you, some of the enabling factor or key pillars that foster digital innovation. Thanks, Riyad. And I, I'd like to go one step further is how do we foster responsible data yes. innovation, right? Digital innovation. You can have lazy innovation, and lazy innovation is one that sort of just tries to do new things, and we all want to have responsible innovation. Um, I'd like to highlight three areas. How many Singaporeans do we have amongst the group? Show of hands. Okay, so we all know the three C's, right? That's what we all aspire to, the cash, the condo, the credit cards. But I think that for responsible data innovation, we also have three C's that we talk about, and that's connectivity, and then capability, which I think has been talked about in the previous um, panel, and then collaboration, which I think Peter also mentioned before. So the connectivity is not just the digital connectivity, it's everything, it's the roads. I think the colleague from Pinduoduo mentioned that Pinduoduo would only have been possible given the initial investments in logistics, for example. So we think about Southeast Asia, I gave this amazing number, 40 million people that's just come on board the digital economy in the last two years, 440 million. But we have 50 million people, approximately, who don't have electricity, let alone digital access. Right? I think we have something like 150 million people who just don't even have a reliable internet connection. And we see this during COVID. COVID's been an amazing accelerator and catalyst of digitalization. But for those who didn't have it, that was also extremely keenly felt when it came to things like remote learning or telehealth or telemedicine, you know, or even just getting reliable information. I must say, if you're online, you also get a lot of bad information as well. But that connectivity is really important. And then the second, the capability, I think that was already mentioned in the previous, in the previous um, panel, that you know, it was really interesting. The Tech for Good Institute found that um, we were looking at the adoption of digital financial services. And digital literacy, even more than financial literacy, digital literacy predicted the adoption of digital financial services. And so if companies want to invest in getting their products and services adopted, they really need to lean in and work together with the governments on digital literacy. 
And Microsoft, for example, has a fabulous, uh, they, they do fabulous programs and curriculums, but what companies can also do is to be able to reach into their customer base and into its network. So that reach into merchants and that reach into consumers that we talked about that platform companies have, that's what that partnership can really do. Um, Microsoft partnered with Grab to put the curriculum, the Microsoft curriculum through the Grab app, for example, into the drivers and to the driver partners. And I think in one year, it reached about half a million driver and driver partners that would previously be really hard to get them into a classroom and teach them about digital literacy. So I think both sides met their KPIs that year. Beyond digital literacy, I think digital fluency and um, sort of a, a familiarity and a comfort with data are really important, not just in the private sector, but in government. I think we talked about e-government in the previous panel, in the public sector, uh, in civil society, and in the non-profit spheres as well. So I'd love to call out some you know, initiatives like data.org by the Rockefeller Foundation and the MasterCard Foundation, where its key purpose is to look at data science for social impact and to really up, you know, ensure that the data sets are available, the tools are available, and use cases are available so that everybody can learn how to use these digital technologies, not just for economic growth, but for inclusive development for everybody as well. And then last but not least is the collaboration part. Um, AI for Good, for example, maintains this wonderful set of data sets where it's linked to every single, it's indexed to every single SDG, and it's got all the metadata there. And the Singapore government also has about 1,800 data sets on open, so data.sg, that's available for public use. And when you have that trusted data sharing, that collaboration becomes even more fruitful. I think at the end of the day, connectivity, capability, and collaboration, those are some of the key priorities for an inclusive and green economy, and also for the responsible digital innovation moving forward. Thank you very much, and thank you for explaining the difference between the three Cs from the Singaporean to your three Cs, which are different to my three Cs at the beginning, where I, talking, I was talking about cl climate change, co COVID-19, and conflict. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, it's a real pleasure. And with that, we've come to the end of our three thematic discussions. We would like to once again thank all our panelists for their incredibly rich conversations and for all your insights on how digital can be applied thoughtfully, inclusively and sustainably to ensure that people and the planet prosper together. So to round off today's conversation, we are very honoured to have with us Mr. Aaron Maniam, Deputy Secretary for the Ministry of Communications and Information. Mr. Maniam will be sharing more about his experiences researching and implementing digital government policy, digital literacy and access programmes, digital economics and digital partnerships, all in the context of leveraging digital for driving sustainability and the 2030 Agenda. Mr. Maniam, please. Thank you very much, uh, Vivian. Thanks very much to the UNDP Global Centre for the kind invitation to join you today. And thanks all of you for, for staying. I, I said the other day at the Mayor's Forum that I don't take it for granted that people stay to the end of a program. You know, so when they do, um, it's something that's very special. And what I wanted to start with today, I had some thoughts uh, along the lines of what Vivian outlined. But after listening to the two firesides and the, the sharing from, from the panel, I thought I might just kind of ditch those prepared remarks and, and share some responses to what, what was said earlier today. Because you, know, you, heard, you heard a lot of different versions of the three Cs, right? From Esther and Riyadh, you heard about COVID, climate change, and conflict. Ming spoke about connectivity, capability, and, and collaboration. Just two days ago at the Mayor's Forum, which I moderated, it was one of the hardest things I've ever moderated. It was 65 people you know, trying, to, and trying to all have one conversation. Um, I think we got some way uh, along that, that aim. But what was really interesting was we started with two Ds, not Cs, but two Ds. Right? They had digitalization and decarbonization, very much along the lines of the theme here, right? Digital and, um, and the green recovery. 
but I guess to keep up with, with both uh, Riyadh and, and, and Ming and Esther here, we should have three Ds, right? So let's think about digitalization, decarbonization, and development, how we get to that, that overall 3D agenda and, and attain the sustainable development goals. And then as I reflected a bit further, I thought, well, maybe I can find three letters of my own, right, to try and, and do this summary. But, but I couldn't, I have to confess, it was just too hard. Um, and then I thought maybe I'll try a Harry Potter trick, right? Because seven is the most magical number according to J.K. Rowling. But I couldn't reach seven either, so I kind of ended up with six in the end. Um, I hope you'll indulge me as I share what those are. And I figured since this is the World Cities Summit, maybe the word cities is the way in which we can kind of bring together these themes. So those are going to be my six letters, right, as I try and summarize this. Not as neat as three Cs or three Ds, but I think we will, they, they'll take us some way in, in exploring where exactly some of these nuances uh, might lie. So the first C in cities is for collaboration. And I do think this is key, right? Collaboration between countries, first of all, but also collaboration between sectors, because none of what we want to do in this green recovery agenda will happen if we are only the public sector or only the private sector or only the people sector. We've got to bring different sectors together in as coherent and cohesive a way as possible. This is why what Esther said about bringing property, uh, the property sector into this, this discussion is so critical. Because you need them, you need the investors to come on board with broader public policy and public value creation agendas. This also means bringing in individual citizens, not just those of us who belong to large aggregated sectors, but individual citizens. Whether that's through citizen science or citizen engagement, as, as Pei Chin talked about. And this is why in Singapore we have a very, very concerted process of participatory policy making, but also of participatory policy delivery. The Emerging Stronger Together process was started as a process of response to COVID-19, but it's something that we'd like to continue, I think. Recently, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Lawrence Wong, announced the movement Forward Singapore, right, or Forward SG. And again, that's all about bringing participation and harnessing the energies of multiple sectors and multiple communities in order to achieve these complex policy aims as we try and combine right, digitization, de decarbonization, and an overall development agenda. What I love in this work, right, this collaborative work, is that it really means everybody has a part to play. Right? Those of us who have, who have obvious roles, like businesses and governments and communities, but sometimes much less obvious ones as well. This is a very little known fact, but a few days ago, one of our libraries in Singapore, the Chua Chu Kang uh, Public Library, was named the best green library in the world by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Now, this may not seem like the most headline-breaking um, announcement, but for me, it matters a great deal. Because partly because who doesn't like a library, right? It's one of the places you can go in and exist without having to buy a coffee. That in itself is, I think, a great public good. But even more importantly than that, pub libraries are where we learn to read. They're some, they're some of the earliest public spaces that we all inhabit. And so for libraries to now be moving into this realm of greening, I think is a key aspect of what we are all, or we can all aspire to, right, in terms of combining tech and the digital as well as a decarbonization agenda. So that's the C in cities, right? What's the first I for? That's where I like to think of the idea of integration. Because you can have lots of collaboration, but if it doesn't all cohere, if it doesn't come together, then I think it stops short of some of the fullness of its potential. And this is where the ecosystem approach that uh, Preet and Riyadh both talked about becomes important. Because we have to integrate these approaches across multiple parts of um, the overall systems that we are dealing with. Sometimes we refer to this as whole of government approach. We used to talk about that a lot. Other countries talk about joined up government. But it's not just government that's involved here, right? It's really a whole of society approach. It's bringing together the health of our economy and our society and our politics and integrating all of that into a coherent whole. Sini struck me as being very much, uh, you know, someone who pushes along these lines when she talked about how you, bring, you have to bring all of the community of farmers along in the processes that she um, engages in as well as young people, right? Let's not forget that we need youth to be involved in this integrated approach. Otherwise, the intergenerational aspects of what we're trying to do will actually start to disappear. We also need to integrate at the regional and global level, and this is where the work of the UN and its um, 
constituent um, bodies like the UNDP become so critical because they enable integration, even if, if not in the most tight way, but at least coordination and collaboration across different countries and, and different regions. And in order to have this happen, I think what is going to be really critical is for there to be technology that all of us can trust to link and bridge and ensure interoperability amongst our different systems. One experiment that we've tried in Singapore is something we call SG TradeX, a common data infrastructure that enables trusted as well as secure data transfer across supply chain ecosystem partners. We hope that this can join eventually with our existing trade net technology and allow for a much more coordinated interoperation amongst different trading partners. Because if that can happen and we eliminate the need for huge transport and transfer costs, then I think we move into a huge paradigm shift right, in how exactly our overall systems can, can operate. So that's the I, right? Integration. T was, could be for many things, but I guess it really has to be about technology, right? given, given the kind of discussion we've been having. And if you listen to the discussions we've had so far, we probably could go through the whole alphabet right, and cover e each letter in terms of different types of technologies. We heard about AI as well as avocados from, from Gary. Uh, we heard about blockchain as well from several speakers. We heard about cloud from Genevieve and crypto. We heard about data, which is of course the key resource that drives so many of those technologies. And the key with data, of course, is that it's not just the data flow itself that needs to take place. We need the rules for that data flow to happen in the most value-creating way, right? Here in Singapore, we at least try to balance between rules that push for innovation as well as rules that ensure security and data protection, right? Both internally as well as cross-border. E would be for emerging technology, right? We didn't really talk today a lot about distributed ledger technology. We started a little bit, but we, that's probably emerging still, and we can, maybe at next year's edition, there'll be a lot more for us to discuss. There's decentralized finance, there's the metaverse, there we go, the M word, someone had to say it, right, in, in, in the whole, in the session. But we'll get there eventually, I think. And so E is for emerging tech. And in all of that, I won't go through the whole alphabet, by the way, don't worry. Uh, you probably, you're probably all sitting there wondering, oh my God, he's only at E now. <laughs> we'll be here forever. No, we'll stop at E, right? I think I kind of made the, the broader point. But the underlying thing I really wanted to say is that in all of the, the T here, all of the technology, we have to think about how we maximize the dividend and not maximize the divide that results from that technology. This is a key part of the sustainable development goals, right? We want to reach out to the least, the last, and the lost, those who are hardest to reach, those who benefit least from some of these emerging um, developments. And this, I think, is why when Ming talked about the unbanked and the underbanked, that's actually a key uh, aspect of this larger process of inclusion and access. We want to reach the undigitalized and the underdigitalized, the those who have not been able to experience the great dividends of these technologies, so that we strengthen the overall green agenda and ensure that it is as inclusive and as, compass, as encompassing as possible. So we've done C and I and T so far, right? Let's move to the second I. Here I think, I'm going to get slightly reflective here, if you don't mind. The second I is something I think about that I like to call intentionality. Right? It's about being deliberate in the overall processes that we put in place. And intentionality is partly about leadership. Right? It's ensuring that we have leadership that understands the deep nuances of this agenda that we have, and also the criticality of the work that they do. And it's not just leadership in a political sense, it's leadership in the business sectors, it's leadership at community levels, it's leadership in families and leadership in schools. It means having the policy and governance infrastructure to reach out in a coherent way to the sorts of um, constituent audiences that we're looking to, to reach. It means having long-term thinking, right? anticipatory approaches where we may not predict the future, but can at least try to understand the ways in which the future might play out so that we are ready and resilient for those different eventualities and possibilities. Intentionality is also about having macro policy at the system level that is structured and systematic, but also at the micro level, right? Ensuring that businesses and enterprises, not just the large ones, but the micro and, and small and medium enterprises too, are all ready to meet the needs of the green agenda. 
It also means that inside those constituent businesses, right, what, at, at the individual level, we need intentionality and deliberateness as well. This means human-centered design in the policies that we put out, catering to the genuine human needs that are out there, which we can learn about with data, thankfully, and also ensuring that each individual citizen has the right skills and training to make the most of the opportunities in the digital space. And here I want to make a plug for something that we haven't talked about a lot, but which I think is an important complement to what both the panel and the, and the two firesides discussed. And this is the idea of wellness, right? We need intentionality around wellness too. Because what are we recovering towards, actually, when we talk about the recovery in, in the title of today's event? We're not recovering to go back to where we were before, right? We need to recover in ways that renew and refresh and revitalize ourselves as individuals, but also the lives that we are leading. And that means that mental wellness and its increasing importance need to be addressed, even as we think about how we use technology and how we green our overall agenda. This means that we want not just growth for its own sake, but good growth. Not just business or greening for its own sake, but good business and good greening so that the wellness of our communities, the mental, emotional, psychic wellness of all of us can be catered to as well. So that's CITI, right? Two more. Second E stands for execution. But it also stands for a few other things. It stands for efficiency, it stands for effectiveness, because we need to focus, I think, on concrete outcomes here. Large pie-in-the-sky visions won't get us very far, right? We need to focus on concrete, human outcomes and how each life out there is going to get affected. But critically, that execution cannot happen in a linear and deterministic way. We will need to experiment because very often when we're dealing with the green agenda and the digital agenda, especially when they merge, we don't know what outcomes are going to look like ex ante. We can't predict all of these because the technology keeps changing on us. So what we need to do is to be able to test and iterate and prototype, right? We need to find examples of, of the AI that, that uh, Riyadh and Ming were discussing earlier, where we will not know how they will function beforehand, but when we try and experiment, we will learn from that process. So this execution and experimentation is all about being in a learning mode and a mode that allows us to test things, right? to be prototypers and to iterate as frequently as we can. That, I think, is what will take us into a new way of operating that is kind of unmechanistic but nonetheless a lot more sophisticated in the approaches that we need to take. So finally, what is the S for in cities? For me, the S is all about synergy. Right? It's a situation where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's where because there is synergy and this wholeness, you have virtuous rather than vicious cycles. It means avoiding silos and fragmentation and allowing systems to come together in wholesome and agile ways. It means catering to not just the economic and the social aspects of the trends we've talked about today, but also the security, right? The cyber and the digital safety aspects. Because as we're harnessing digital, we will also have to deal with a lot more scams, a lot more misinformation, and we have to make sure that those are well managed so that the fullness and the wholeness of the green agenda can be actually realized. And this is how we build trust rather than distrust, to go back to a theme that, that Jessica talked to us, I think, quite, quite a bit about. So as we think about how we go away from today, I hope you'll all think about how we can be cities ourselves, right? how we can be collaborative, how we can integrate, how we can harness technology, how we can be intentional, how we can execute and experiment well, and most of all, how we can synergize, not just within ourselves, but amongst all the different potential partnerships that can exist. And if we can do that, then the World City Summit, as well as this afternoon's program, I think, will have moved a great deal towards its overall aim in this 2030 agenda. So thanks again very much for having me, and I wish you all well. Thank you, Aaron, for weaving so beautifully and poetically right, um, all these crucial themes. Uh, it's true, green recovery needs whole of society, and that means all of you here in this room with us. So I hope that inspired ideas and reflections, and more importantly, I hope that this will inspire new connections and new possibilities this afternoon. 
So here we have in the room gathered global experts and innovators. Please connect and perhaps discuss the question that Aaron brought up. You know, as a community, what are we recovering for? Um, I thought that's a great uh, food for thought for the afternoon. Once again, on behalf of the UNDP team, Riyadh, um, Caleb, uh, Ganda, Jim C, Charlotte, um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon for UNDP's flagship event. Please do keep in touch with UNDP as well. Um, by following uh, the UNDP Global Center on all these channels. So it's website, Twitter, <laughs> LinkedIn, or you can also reach out to the UNDP Global Center via the email. Thank you once again um, and have a great afternoon.